having heard the previous presentation, I feel that sort of where do we fit in with cultural diplomacy? Um, but hopefully you'll see that there, that is something that is involved in music making in the community. So firstly, just to tell you a little bit about um, making music. Um, it's a membership organization that's been in existence since 1935. It's a charity. And at the moment, we have uh, 3,228 member groups. Um, and uh, that means about probably 180,000 individuals involved in those groups making music. Um, of those, about 58% will be vocal groups. I deliberately don't say choirs because obviously they could be um, a variety of vocal groups around these days. 28% um, instrumental groups, again, of, of all sorts of kinds, from a you know, samba band to a, a full-scale uh, symphony orchestra. And 14% are promoters, by which I mean they're amateur promoters that present professional artists. So there will be a group of volunteers that get together in a particular area and, and uh, you know, organise concerts for the community. Um, so uh, our members at the last survey that we did uh, put on uh, over 12,000 concerts a year and to audiences of an estimated 1.7 million. That actually dwarfs the professional orchestras. Uh, audiences, um, not obviously total music audiences, uh, which are much, much larger than that, um, but certainly it, it's an impact and um, it's often uh, the only music that's available in a community. Um, so making music, um, just to put our statistics in context, only covers an estimated third of all the amateur music groups in the UK, so there's probably at least 10,000. And uh, as far as I'm aware, you know, this kind of activity goes on all over the world, um, but the UK has had a long tradition of this, um, mostly starting in the 19th century, um, and uh, it is particularly vibrant uh, kind of scene. Um, so if you could move on, please. Um, so about these amateur music groups. So amateur here does not mean amateurish. Um, it is absolutely no reflection on their technical skill, which varies consider considerably because you've got um, groups from complete beginners to really uh, highly technically skilled. Um, and uh, what it means is that they're doing it for the love of it. If you go back to the, the Latin origin of the word, and we define it as people who make music in their spare time. They're not doing it for a living, even though a lot of professional musicians are also involved in this sector. Um, and this whole music activity is quite often invisible. Um, there's an anthropologist called Ruth Finnegan who published a book in the um, 80s um, which really is still valid today, and it was called The Invisible Musicians, and it mapped in one city in the UK, that was in Milton Keynes, all the different musical networks that were happening. And it's really interesting, because they were like in parallel worlds. Um, so, you know, you had a whole network of kind of rock and pop bands, amateur rock and pop bands. You had a whole network of sort of uh, community choirs. You had a whole other network of, of jazz, uh, or folk or country and western and uh, their paths quite often didn't cross um, so they, they're invisible from, from that point of view to, to each other um, they're also uh, invisible because they're usually not funded by any public bodies and so what the public bodies don't fund they don't take note of necessarily and so um, that is becoming a problem at the moment in the UK because local authorities, for instance, are having far less money to spend. And as a consequence, they are uh, sometimes withdrawing support indirectly from these kind of community groups without being aware of it. So for instance, uh, it, Previously, uh, councils may have uh, supported local venues, uh, which allowed those venues to give special affordable rates for um, amateur groups to, to hire them for performances, concerts. Um, now that the council 
doesn't have that money, doesn't subsidize the venue, the venue has to cover their costs, therefore the prices go up. So that's an indirect effect that they had not factored in. Um, so that's happening uh, quite a lot due to their invisibility. Um, sorry, if you could move on to the next one, please. So just to say a little bit <coughs> about what might be a typical music group. Um, would maybe meet weekly, um, roughly during school term time. So they would have three lots of holidays structured around the Christian calendar, you know, Christmas and Easter and then uh, the summer. Um, the participants would usually be very local. Um, in a rural area, maybe they would come from 10 or 20 miles away. But in towns, you know, you would probably go and sing in a choir in your part of town, not even, you know, uh, across the city necessarily. Um, and they, as I said before, they vary enormously from completely open access beginner to, um, you know, uh, groups that might audition people um, and uh, demand quite high uh, technical skills. Um, they're very often run by a group of volunteers that are constituted themselves into a committee and they run as a charity. Um, so. I'm afraid I'm a little bit ignorant about how things are in, in other Commonwealth countries. Um, but so here, the Charity Commission regulates charities, and of its 162,000 registered charities, most are what they describe as kitchen table charities. So that's exactly what this would be, you know, a small charity that's set up by a group of volunteers and basically run from their kitchen table. Um, that's what that refers to. Um, and like I say, they're usually entirely led by volunteers, um, and uh, they, they're they both there to draw on and to give back to the local community. A lot of them will see their function as um, doing something for the local community. For instance, they might be fundraising for a local hospice or a school or other you know, local issues. Um, they might uh, perform for other local charities, you know, who do fundraising events or whatever, so they'd offer their services to sing or perform uh, at those. Um, and other local civic events, you know, opening of buildings or whatever. And they would also go quite often into care homes or hospitals and, and uh, perform something there because they see their function as, as giving something back to the community. Um, so, uh, please, could you move on to the next one? So, when Mark first approached me about this, um, I was like, we have nothing to do with the Commonwealth, and we don't work internationally, and d do we do anything about cultural diplomacy? And um, uh, he persuaded me that actually we do, and we do. Um, because, firstly, because music is a universal language that can be understood. Um, by everybody, wherever they're from, and whatever language uh, they might, in words, they might speak. Um, and also because, you know, participation in a music ensemble can draw people from different communities and backgrounds together um, to collaborate and experience something together in a way that, that isn't often uh, possible in, in other scenarios. And um, we do also believe very strongly, as I think uh, Mark does, that um, you know, cultural diplomacy does start at home. It does start with you inviting the neighbor to take part in something with you. And um, that is exactly the sort of thing that, that music groups are very good at doing on a local level. Um, so, uh, sorry, could you move on to the... So, do music groups contribute to this, and, and, and how do they do it? Um, so firstly, I think maybe they don't. Quite often they might be set up by a musical director who um, would like to you know, set something up in their locality, who thinks there might be a choir missing. So it, it, is there a lot of personal motivation behind it? Um, and uh, I mean, that's also need it because it needs someone who's driven. It, you know, it's a lot of work, any of those uh, kind of groups. Um, so, so the reason for setting it up may be personal in some way, you know, for that individual, um, because they want to do it, they want to do a kind of music, they want to develop their career. Um, 
But often there are also uh, what I might call diplomatic reasons, because you know there might be community coming together to decide that they want to do something together. Um, so there are uh, you know often. Um, uh, housing estates or various neighbourhoods that come together or say a tenants association in a housing estate or something like that that will set up a choir um, uh, to, to create a community in their area. Um, and, uh, and also there's a lot of people, professionals or amateurs who feel that um, they want to open up this fantastic thing called music that gives them so much pleasure and enjoyment to everybody. Um, but I think the main way that music groups contribute to cultural diplomacy is really, in a way, unconsciously. They're not set up, necessarily, to bring together uh, communities, <coughs> but they, it's a consistent side effect of um, uh, them being there. So because you, you are thrown together with people on their musical enthusiasm, uh, rather than whatever their uh, you know age is or socioeconomic background or or uh, you know ethnic background, so um, you, you're drawn together because you want to perform a particular uh, piece of music. So it it uh, gets people talking to each other that might not always uh, might not otherwise meet. Um, I mean, a, an example of a workplace choir that does this is the Parliament Choir, because you can have everybody from someone in the House of Lords to the cleaner can be a member of that choir. So that's an example of kind of pulling people together uh, in that sense. Um, so, sorry, can you move on, please? Mm. So um, there are issues, though, um, uh, in terms of what music groups can do, um, because musical genres and traditions have separate networks. As I said, Ruth Finnegan described this quite well in her book, and this is the case, that there's a whole network of sort of Western classical music ensembles and choirs, um, and then there's a whole network of um, jazz enthusiasts uh, and bands. There's a whole network of, of folk people, uh, you know, um, there's a, a whole network of choirs that are connected to uh, sort of Afri various African churches, for instance, so like gospel choirs of various kinds. So, you know, they, they do form separate networks, and uh, that is a challenge. Also, the generations, you know what I mean? Oh, I'm not going to join that choir because everybody else is over 50. You know, you need to, you know, it's a, it's a, crowd thing, you know what I mean? How do you create the right balance so that you do have uh, a number of younger people so that there's a reason for the under 35s to, to go to this choir because they're going to have a social time there as well as the over 50s. And um, socioeconomic classes tend to have separate networks as well. I mean, there's, for instance, um, as a generalisation, I would say that uh, probably marching bands and brass bands are more working class here in Britain, and uh, classical groups may be more middle class. So that is partly to do with the education system, obviously, you know, who had the chance to learn a classical Western instrument when they were younger and therefore carry on that enthusiasm. Um, whereas uh, brass bands and marching bands tend to be much more open and uh, to, to beginners and people who haven't had traditional uh, music education as, as a young person. Um, sorry, could you move on, please? So, are music groups the right tool to, to try and bring communities together? Um, and we think, in principle, absolutely, and Xenia's going to talk a little bit more about her own work in, in that area in a minute. Um, in practice, there, there may be challenges there, but this is one of the things that Xenia and us at Making Music are working on at the moment, is to, to make sure that groups are not exclusive, that they are being accessible to uh, all generations and to all musical genres and uh, to new audiences and to newcomers in, in general. 
Um, but what we don't want to end up doing is for every choir to perform every repertoire from the Messiah to Mamma Mia to a gospel. But, you know, so what we want is people to be joining things because they love that particular music um, rather than because it's the music of their community or whatever it might be, you know. So, um, uh yeah, I mean, you know, anybody could love jazz, anybody could love gospel, anybody could love classical, uh, Western classical music. Um, so, uh, yes, we have to be careful not to end up with a soup of everything is the same. Um, sorry, could you move on, please? So, <coughs> there are other types of community groups that do a, a similar job we think um you know that are volunteer led and and a desire have a desire to to serve the community in which they live um and uh, that might have a similar potential to unite communities because they're not say uh language related which might be a problem so visual arts obviously lots of crafts um uh, from textiles to pottery or uh, things like cooking or gardening uh, you know they're they're all community groups that that um, could work um, there's other groups that might be more specific um, for instance I think the the many many societies of local organists are probably fairly linked to a Christian religion so obviously that might not be of interest to people of other faiths um, if you could move on, thank you. Um, so what, what do you need for this kind of activity? Because this kind of activity comes from the grassroots up, which is the best way, we feel, for, you know, uh, for it to work, because um, it needs the enthusiasm of local people. It's not something um, that will work if you parachute in a professional to do something who will then leave again. Um, that, that is a problem. It needs people enthusiastic on the ground who do this. But what does it need um, to flourish? And this is where, when you have conversations, certainly here in the UK, at, at uh, ground level with local authorities, you see it's not very sexy, this kind of activity. You know, um, I mean, I just um, think of Leicester, as an example. So a few years ago, it must be about 10 years ago now, they built this, you know, um, uh, theater in the middle of Leicester as part of regeneration. Uh, it, it cost them an absolute fortune, um, built by a star architect. And, um, okay, they're just about making it work financially now. But actually, to the many, many music groups of many backgrounds, because Leicester in particular has a very large Asian uh, population, would have found it much more useful to have lots and lots of venues supported in their neighbourhoods. But that obviously doesn't make for good PR and good, you know, uh, it, it's, it's that kind of thing that you're... Um, you have to explain uh, to, to councillors uh, and local authorities. Um, recently, the, the Arts and Humanities Research Council brought out a report called Understanding the Value of Arts and Culture. And there, you know, they, there's, a no, there's quite a lot of research on this in the United States, but not enough in the UK. Uh, but they come to the conclusion that the participatory nature of community arts may mean that it has the greatest potential for developing sustainable communities. So this is what, you know, it's a mantra that certainly the UK government and local authorities go on about, you know, having sustainable communities, having strong communities of people, obviously uh, mindful of bridging um, many cultural you know, chasms that, that exist in those uh, communities, but they may be going about this not in the right way. Um, that is the problem. So, uh, as I say, money or large-scale investment isn't necessarily what's needed, but um, public support for, for local infrastructure. Um, so, I mean, in a way, I think I'm getting a little bit 
further down the road with this message now because of the financial difficulties of local authorities. Um, and I'm saying to them, you don't need to spend big amounts of money. It's what you need to do is listen to the community and spend it where they need it. Um, so rather than spending 64 million on a flagship theatre, spend 10,000 on the local community hall so that it is fit for purpose for anyone to, to perform. So, so I'm making a little bit of headway on that. So it's more like the indirect um, uh, a subsidy, like I say, community venues to be affordable, um, helping to promote uh, all that community activity through official channels that exist, you know, whether that's um, uh, you know, a local tourist office or the local council, they all have online platforms now that they could support this kind of activity. And they could help with advice and expertise because they probably have a dedicated communications team. Um, uh, sort of amateur music groups don't necessarily know how to promote themselves, get audiences, um, design a flyer, you know, have a website. Um, so, so that kind of stuff, actually, with, with their expertise, they could be very helpful. And obviously, also in music terms specifically, um, uh, what we call music libraries. So this is um, a facility for borrowing music um, from local public libraries. And it's uh, through the interlibrary loan system in this country, you could then access repertoire all over the country. And this is a service that's seriously under threat because it's not a statutory service, so councils do not have to provide it. And that's a campaign that we've been working on with councils to find kind of sustainable models for them to carry on uh, hosting such a, a necessary resource. Um, so if you could move on, thank you. So um, again, like we'll email you this because it'll be easier if you look at the links that I've put in here. Um, but so uh, I'll just pulled out a couple of uh, members. So we've got the Oldworth Philharmonic Society uh, Orchestra. They're near Reading, um, just west of London, and uh, they are trying to open up uh, membership in the orchestra to younger people by not working in a regular uh, kind of, you've got to come every week to be part of the concert at the end of the season rhythm, but they're working on a project by project basis. So you could sign up, yes, I've got time, you know, in October to be there for the concert, so I'll come to rehearsals from September to October, and then I can't do the next bit. So, so by doing that, they've got a much younger group of people involved. Um, they're also, they've been working um, with uh, uh, young people they, and uh, working across arts with local artists. So they got a group of uh, teenagers to meet some local artists, select some pictures, and then um, reflecting Mussorgsky's pictures at an exhibition, they wrote compo little compositions to, to match those uh, pictures. So, so again, that's a way of getting young people and uh, involved in their group, but also giving those young people an outlet to experiment with music um, uh, and work with, with artists at the same time. Um, the Cobweb Orchestra is one of my favorite members because they're a completely open access orchestra. And this is founded by, the, the, uh, by uh, an inspirational leader called Andy Jackson, who just thinks that the classical Western uh, orchestral repertoire is fantastic and everybody should be able to um, participate in it. Um, so I tried this for myself. I have never played a cello before, but I went up to see him there in the northeast of England and um, he gave me a cello. I do read music, so that was a start. Um, and he gave me the music and someone gave me five minutes instructions on the cello. And uh, then I was able to play with a group for two hours. So, okay, I only played every tenth note, but oh my God, I was having a great time. Because rather than having to go away and learn the cello in my bedroom, you know, for three years before anybody would let me in, I was able to take part. And this is the whole point of doing this, is doing it with other people. Music is really about 
you know, doing it um, in a group and to an audience. So um, I was having a fantastic time. And But that is down to his leadership. He did not make me feel inadequate. He did not make me feel like any attention was particularly directed towards me. He just ignored me, you know, and left me to get on, do you know what I mean, like everybody else. And the rest of the orchestra were equally welcoming. They were all, oh, why are you here? Why? And, and have you played? Oh, you're doing really well. They were so encouraging that, um, you know, uh, anybody would feel at home in such a group. So, so that's the kind of attitude that we're trying to make sure that all our groups have. Um, I mentioned a sort of completely different uh, type of member. It's the choir with no name. Now, they run choirs in various locations in the UK for people who are affected by homelessness. So a lot of them will be people that, they, that have, are living on the streets. And they have a weekly rehearsal with a hot dinner at the end. And uh, it's... I have heard some. I've heard their concerts, and I've heard some of their stories, and it's unbelievable what this does in terms of building their confidence, and also for helping other people to look at them as people, and not that's the sort of I'm not going to look at this person whilst I rush past on my way to work. So, um, it, you know, it has an incredible effect on them but also the communities in which they are, which are seeing homeless people in a completely different light through, through this. Um, and finally, just one more, the People's Orchestra is another open access orchestra um, in uh, Birmingham. And uh, they were recently featured and the, the BBC did a, a short series called the Great Orchestra Challenge this summer. And they were one of the five um, orchestras featured in that and uh, you know they have an enormous variety of people who may not have played in an orchestra before they will accept a saxophone which isn't really part of a kind of traditional orchestra setup um, they will have more flutes if more flutes turn up so it's a it's a very open and embracing um, environment and they do things like uh, they got permission from Virgin Trains, who run the West Coast train line, to do a flash mob um, on one of their trains. So they were kind of uh, enjoying um, playing the music that they like to people who maybe had never heard this kind of thing before. So um, that's just a few examples. So um, I think the time has come now. Zenia, for me to hand over to you. So uh, Zenia will talk a little bit more about uh, some of the stuff that she's involved with in her sort of non-making music capacity. So if you can move on that. Um.